Okay. Go ahead. First up is Bailey. <laughs> Okay, so the start. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so, so originally I was asked to talk about uh, collectivity in small systems and what we can learn about the initial state there. And uh, so I will still do that uh, next week so if you are here. <laughs> and so today I want to discuss some uh, something different, uh, some recent results in ultra peripheral collisions at LHC and you know, what we can learn from that probe, some very unique aspects of the near state, especially the, the ultra dense uh, long state of nucleus. Um, so, the, the main theme of this workshop is to understand the initial state of the nucleus. Uh, so, using heavy, high energy heavy equations, and this uh, is kind of good and, and also bad. So the bad part is that you create a, a lot of the big mass in the final state. There, one has to understand the final state effect. But the good part is that uh, once we have a good handle on the final state effect, uh, we can use that to learn something very unique about the initial state. For example, the, the collective uh, block creation and correlation. So that's something you won't be able to get from other approaches. Um, and, and, and also like the, the deformation, that's something I uh, started to learn recently and I learned a lot from this workshop. And uh, the one question I'm, I'm uh, wondering maybe has discussed here that I miss is that so this the initial state that we talk about in the high energy in the high ion collisions and and this nuclear structures you measure at the low energy and to what extent they are actually uh, related at the quantitative level because uh, we know that the, the relevant degree of freedom that in the initial state they, they will evolve dynamically uh, with energy so you go to higher and higher energy. The, uh, the gluon will start to become dominant. And now, of course, we have a framework to, uh, to evaluate that. And so, the high energy, how those deformations will actually uh, come into play. And that's still a uh, question being studied. But in any case, so my focus here is to, to understand at the high energy limits um, where the, the structure of the, of the nuclear or nucleus is dominated by the, by the gluons. And to, to prove that, so the, clean, the cleaner way to do that is, as we know, is to use the, to turn off the final state, uh, for example, using the electrons in the DIS, uh, in the DIS um, um, uh, collisions. And we've seen that the, the gluon, the density of the gluon that we go to smaller and smaller x, it seems to rise, uh, it rise indefinitely uh, to, X 10 to the minus four and maybe even 10 to the minus five. So the natural question is to ask, you know, what's, uh, what's the fate of the gluons at extreme densities at a very small X? And that's, that's something relevant for the inner state at high energy in the heavy ion collisions. And the naive expectation is that, it, of course, this cannot keep going forever. At some point, you are going to hit the unitarity uh, that the, the so-called nonlinear uh, effect uh, the two gluons really combine into a one gluon uh, will start to kick in. And uh, so at some point, uh, the, this recombination and the gluon splitting process will reach a balance and the density of the gluon will reach some kind of saturation. So at which point we'll reach a saturation uh, quantitatively, we don't know yet, uh, but they should depend on the, the density of the gluons or the X or the, the resolution that we probe it. Q square uh, experimentally, you can control that. Uh, so there will be really, in general a very small x, not very uh, uh, high Q square. We should see uh, onset of the saturation, which should impact the structure of the nucleus um, that uh, serve as the initial stage of high energy collisions. Uh, so I would say that there's so far there's no conclusive evidence for observing the saturation yet. Um, and so one thing to mention is that. So when you, if you go to from nuclear to the nucleus, the expectation is that um, it will become easier to, you have better chance to see the saturation because the, the saturation scales are expected to be enhanced by, uh, by A to the, to the third. And so this is basically, uh, you, uh, you the nucleus is the kind of a lab that uh, we have the best chance to observe the saturation effect. And this is what the electron ion collider is trying to do, for example using EA collisions um, by scanning the, the Q square. So the whole is that you can maybe go in and out of the separation region 
so that you can see the transition. Of course, as we know, the electron ion collider, the energy is limited. So in general, you want to go to very small X, you want to go to as high energy as, as possible. So that is what the advantage for the LHC. Um, uh, uh, T, uh, the TEV scale, in particular, the ultra peripheral collision, we can probe deeply into the very small X region. What will be the conclusive values? What I mean, so yeah. I'll show maybe from the data I will show later today. Um, that's so, so we see, uh, maybe so. So we'll, 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 we'll <laughs> that, that's but that's a good question. Whether we'll ever have a because there's always people think okay, there are these results suggest saturation or consistent with saturation, but yeah, we still think this is not conclusive, so that's why I wonder. Yeah. That, that, that's all we established this, yeah. So look at the result I will show and then. Yeah, so so more on to the, the ultra peripheral collisions that at the LHC, this is what Dr. John has already introduced this uh, yesterday. I'll uh, so quickly uh, go over some of the basics. So these are basic kind of the collisions. They, they, the two uh, ions, they miss, miss each other at large impact parameters, but they still carry strong electromagnetic field. So therefore they serve as a source of photons. Uh, therefore there can still interactions between the two photons, produce a pair of the uh, leptons, or you can also have a photon uh, interact um, with a so-called pomeron with from the other nucleus and you know, to the leading order, um, the pomeron is can be a two gluon state, it's a color, color neutral state. But in this way, you, you can you produce a vector meson, but you do uh, in this process you probe the um, the gluons from uh, from from the nucleus. To focus on the my focus. <laughs> Here is to, to understand the nucleus, so we focus on the photonucleus interactions. In the in the in the uh, photonucleus, uh, the, in particular, the vector made on the photo production. So the nice thing of this process is that the all the uh, final state kinematics are well defined because you, you can measure the rapidity and the PT of the uh, vector made on. So you fully determine the uh, the initial center of mass energy of the photon nucleus. And you can determine the T exchange uh, from this T channel uh, process. So it's a very clean, uh, well defined process. Um, and, we can, and also, you can kind of see that at the leading order, uh, at leading order, the, the cross section uh, for this process will be proportional to the gluon PDF square. Okay. Uh, so, therefore, so they, they, they will serve as an excellent probe of the, the gluon in initial state. Um, there are two types of uh, uh, vector meson photo production. One is the coherent, uh, where you interact with gluons um, coupled with the entire nucleus. So you probe the average gluon distribution. Or you can also have the incoherent um, <coughs> production, which probes in the local uh, density of gluons, and you, can, you are sensitive to the event by event fluctuations of the, of the, uh, of the gluon uh, distribution. So both are very important. They provide uh, different uh, information. To show you first the JPS photo production in the uh, uh, photon nuclear interaction that that has been measured uh, over the past decades. From you, you can have a photon uh, source from either uh, can be a, a heavy ion or proton, can also be an electron. For example, in, in heroes, the electron uh, proton uh, interactions. As so you can measure the, the production cross-section uh, here as a function of, this is the center of mass, mass energy of the photon and the, and the proton. And what you see is that the cross-section uh, increase uh, very quite rapidly as you increase uh, the center of mass energy, or equivalently, you are probing to smaller and smaller x. So, so therefore, uh, so data here that they can work quite well describe a series with uh, no or little saturation effect. So, this is what we would kind of expect uh, from the fact that the gluon density rise uh, quickly as you go to uh, smaller and smaller x. And maybe except for you know, there's one series that. 
CGC IP uh, set model, which has the long saturation effect, and you go to much smaller and smaller X, you can start to see that it starts to bend down, uh, where the saturation effects uh, become significant. So the expectation is if you go to even smaller X, much higher W, maybe eventually this trend will turn over, become flat. But looks like at this moment, at 10 to the minus 5 X, we do not see a clear sign of saturation in the proton yet, right? However, as I mentioned, this is a proton, right? If you go to the large nucleus, if we can do the same measurement, because in the nucleus, it might be easier to see the saturation. We may see some different behavior, may see something that the saturation may keep in order. Right? Before I go to the, the nucleus, just one more, uh, one more thing to mention about the incoherent uh, production. Uh, this is uh, a paper from Kubiro and Heike, where, where, where they show that um, when, you come, when you look at the, the in, so, so these blue points, this is the, the incoherent JEP site uh, cross section as a function of T, where uh, they have shown that in the model, if you assume a smooth uh, shape of the proton or the fluctuation shape of the proton, so that they do and, uh, have some sensitivity to the in, uh, incoherent production, right? Um, you send it here to fluctuation of the long distribution. This, this doesn't prove that you know the the eccentricity model there is has to be correct, but it does provide some sensitive give some idea whether you model your fluctuation is uh, reasonably well or not. And so then, now let me go to can I ask a question about that point. Why is the the the, the theory dip in Cohen dip down a lot more? Towards zero p much faster than the data. I think maybe you are unsure. Is there a way about the certainty of the data of p? Is there an intuitive picture why it happened? Um, so this one is IP set. And, um, so there's, there's a few fluctuations actually at, at low t. So low t, if you have like overall normalization fluctuation, then you can keep this. I but it's missing some fluctuations, for example. So if you do it with the PVC and have the QS fluctuation itself, then you describe it much better than if you just made it. So it depends on whether you have fluctuation function on long length scales and long things. Okay. And these okay, are so it's yeah. kind of cut get cut off by yeah, it's just the stop that. more get cut off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you said shape fluctuations. I think the uh the, the curve is really uh, sensitive to size fluctuations, but not to shape. So the, the size, the size is, like, um, is in principle true, but but incoherent yeah. in principle it pro probes the, the kind of the local uh, density of the globe. Yeah. So more naturally, it will be fluctuating like this mm -hmm. instead of the. I, I agree, but the question is what is what is it that controls the mm -hmm. level of energy? But it depends with any fluctuations of the scattering amplitude, right? And some of them are geometric. It's just like, yeah, in one event you hit a, a, a hot spot, in one you don't, then you don't really have contribution to that area. I mean, it, it, this doesn't constrain the geometry directly. The question is the T meaning should be dependent on whether it's a, a scattering on the proton or scattering on the nuclei, right? And this is the yeah, this is the, the electron proton. Uh, this is so electron. we are showing we are showing coherent yeah, and so incoherent. Yeah, this is incoherent. Incoherent yeah, coherent is on nuclei, right? On the, on the entire nuclei. And then we are on scattering on the proton. So the T minimum depends on whether you scatter on, on the larger object or on the small object, right? That follow may be due to the T minimum. Oh, it's a proton here. It is a proton. It's incoherent. It's a proton. Like a proton breakup. Both of them cannot be coherent or incoherent. Coherent is only right? No, no, no. The incoherent is using camera data, right? This is gamma p collision, e p collision. So coherent will be you you interact the proton as a whole. Incoherent will be you you interact with some gluon inside. Inside uh, nuclear. Very... The data points are all right. You're going really fast. What is the 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 in the slope in the T? Um, the 
and this okay the, the incoherent reality of counting with the uh, uh, other activities uh, in the very forward direction so that's how they determine the coherent reality is the elastic uh, scatters uh, you, you don't you don't observe other activities experimentally how you distinguish between coherent and incoherent so so for the incoherent reality the, the, the new kind of break up will generate uh, activities in the forward detector so you, so you, so you you just if you observe activities in the forward uh, Direction is so, the multiplicity or something. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm, now I'm moving to nucleus. Right? And the goal is to see what's happening in nucleus. So I, basically, I want to measure this in nucleus as a function of W and to see whether uh, it's still uh, rapidly rising or there's any other trend. Um, so this the, in nucleus, uh, in the using the uh, uh, line lab UPC, the measurement has been done actually. Uh, over the past many years, and this is at least result. It's not shown as a function of W yet. It's shown as a function of rapidity. So I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but the, the first thing you will see that the, this curve here, this is so-called impulse of transformation. This is like the, the uh, free nucleon uh, expectation when you don't have any nucleus effect. And you do immediately see that uh, the data is a significant uh, suppression uh, of the data relative to the impulse approximation. There's definitely a strong nuclear effect that has suppressed the, the, the observed cross-section. The question is uh, how, uh, what's the mechanism? Now here, there are all different models. Um, for example, the one, one class of model is the so-called nuclear shadow or the leading in the lead, from the leading twist approximation framework. Where um, you don't need uh, gluon separation, but uh, you better separation from interference with interaction between different nucleons. And different uh, class of model is motivated by the gluon separation, for example, the, the IPSAT model, and many of other models here. So I, if you like, I can go through this in detail later. They are motivated by gluon separation. They, they both can give you a suppression, but at a quantitative level, right? As, if you see at quantitative level, there's no theory actually can describe the data uh, both at mid rapidity <laughs> and high rapidity simultaneously. They either you get mid rapidity, you end up with high rapidity, or you describe high rapidity, you overshoot mid rapidity. So that's kind of a puzzle that uh, we, will we do not understand yet. There was speculation that there might be something wrong with the data, with the Alice data. So I, I, I will address that uh, in a moment. Um, but then I want to, there's one, there's one complication here. To really understand what's going on um, with the theory, there's one complication here because we are looking at a symmetric system. So there's a so-called two-way ambiguity that, so you don't know which uh, nucleus emitting the photon, which nucleus e e emitting the polymer. So if you detect the gypsum in one direction, so it can be uh, this ion, to emit a photon, high energy photon, but, uh, interact with a low energy polymer from the other, or it can also be this ion emit a high energy polymer, uh, interact with a low energy photon uh, from the other ion. So, kind of make this mixture of these two contributions together um, if you only look at rapidity. Now, this is not a problem at mid rapidity. Mid rapidity is symmetric. So, you know exactly what X of gluon you are probing. But if you go away from the mid rapidity, for example, uh, take very extreme case rapidity around four, you get a mixture of the X from the 10 to the minus five and 10 to the minus two, they, they, they mix together. Then it's actually dominated by, tend to dominate by the large X contribution. So there this measurement, we don't have a sensitivity to the uh, gluon distribution in the nucleus at very small X, or 10 to the minus five. From this data, we, 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 we don't have direct sensitivity to that. So we, yeah. when the model compare with data, do they take this into account? Yeah, of course. The, 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 okay, the model, when model calculates, they, they, they can calculate the W dependence, then they sample the, um, the photon flux, uh, you know, considering these two cases, and then add them together. Yeah, so in the model, the model we can pair it does take this two that, in sum together. They sum together. They sum that's also interference. That's also interference. No, no, he's, a, he's a model. Yeah, in the model as well. 
interference, not just the direct current, but also yeah. interference between the two x. Oh, in interference, yes, interference. The the interference in fact is the only the strongest in the middle rapidity and the very low momentum. Yeah, but it's it's there. The it, it is there. Yes. Well, why is the momentum dominant? Because the photon production is larger. The photon flux tend to be uh the photon flux higher at uh lower uh, photon energy. The high photon energy flux is smaller. Because the more blue the minus five percent greater flux effect. Yeah, definitely. So the goal, we, we basically what we have to do is to try to separate them, decompose them, to find a way to do that. So how to do that? So the, the high energy photon is is it emitted at early stage, very very early stage. The high energy photon, but they come together with the ions. They come, uh, yeah. Okay. The the stable surrounding ions come together with with the ions. So how to separate the, uh, these these two uh, the contribution? They actually uh, one approach has been proposed many years ago uh, by these authors that you basically what you have to do is to control the centrality of ultra period populations or the impact parameter of ultra period population. With this very the idea is the same, I would say the same as the centrality of the hydronic equation. So you look at the multiplicity distribution of the Ultra peripheral collision. In this case, we look at the, the neutron, the neutron multiplicity in the very forward direction. And they are produced by the electromagnetic interaction, electromagnetic dissociation. When we change the photons, you may excite the nucleus <coughs> to put some giant metal resonance and they will decay and emit a neutron that we can detect at uh, almost zero degree. So that probability um, is expected to be proportional to the inverse of the impact parameter uh, square. Oh, question. My new question. So when you have this uh, <clears throat> uh, photon and the Palmer emitted, uh, which which one travels long distance distance before they meet? Like the Palmer also can travel long distance meet with photon or so this infrared with this? No, I'm, you're talking about infrared parameter. So so where you produce oh, this, uh, which are uh, just are closer to the photon emitting one or the Palmer emitting one? Well, the jet the, the has to be close to the Palmer and the Palmer cannot go to large distance. So the jet has produced uh, around the uh, okay. surface of the neutral. Palmer is a color neutral, so why cannot travel some distance? No, they can't color neutral, but still a cool color. They have a large neutrality. Um, it, it has a large mass with the virtual state, right? So it's a large virtual state is called real yeah. particle. Also, depends on your frame. In our picture at high energy, there is no palmer on it, right? You just throw it, the, the photon splits into a QQ bar, which then interacts with you the target. Yeah, yeah. In the, in, yeah, in the turkey picture, you just have to go. Uh, so this is the starlight, uh, the model that shows you if you, if you select, for example, if the new, no, you don't observe neutron, you observe some neutron, at least one neutron in one direction, or you observe both neutron in both uh, in neutron in both direction, and what's the probability of the uh, uh, interaction at different impact parameters? So you see that you require both neutron, uh, neutron in both direction you tend to sample small impact parameter events, when you don't require neutron, you, you are dominated by the large impact parameter event. So yeah, basically this is an exact analogy to the centrality, right? We can use this to control the impact parameter. But by doing that, what we are going to again is the folly. Well, actually, just to convince you that we, we understood this process reasonably well. So this is the cross-section measure by Alice for the the, the, for the neutron emission uh, uh, events as a function of the number of neutrons that you see that for one neutron, two neutron, how they compare to these models, um, they, they agree reasonably well, right? Until you get to the table, uh, there's uh, maybe uh, some fraction of the four seconds, there's some uncertainty. That, so of course, will contribute to the uncertainty of the variance. Quick comment. 
And people always draw there is an angle when photon come in and the, the lead also diffracted. But one of the basic assumptions of the equivalent photon approximation is the lead maintain the speed and the momentum. It doesn't change its angle. Otherwise, you cannot calculate P. The P is directly calculated from the Jeff side. Assume everything else didn't do anything. That's right. right. So, but it's a good approximation. The T is small. That's why it doesn't yeah. detract. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. So then what we do is the following. For each rapidity bin, so we will measure the transaction in different UPC psychology. So we, we instead of only have one measurement, we have multiple measurement. And they will have a contribution from different mixture of the high energy photon and low energy photon. Because the, the photon flux you sample is different. It's shown in this paper. So what this is what we measure, the photon flux we get from the theory, the photon approximation. I want to extract, we want to solve this equation and extract the two terms. Um, these two cross sections, like one at low photon energy, one at high photon energy. So we'll do that for multiple repeated events. In the end, we will get a set of points as a function of the center of mass energy of the photon and the nucleus so that we can probe the x to the very small region and then as long as this x the number of neutrons is small enough you're confident that this is all coherent so right so it's 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 coherent, but it's exciting it's 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 coherent yeah, yeah. it's coherent so the a, a prime you mean is just excited they are excited but they still want to look at coherent uh, <clears throat> So the excitation is on the former side. The excitation, um, not, necessarily, not necessarily. Which one? I mean, do you, which one uh, dominates? Are they equal? So, so they could, they do have some correlation, but for, for the coherent, they're independent. No, no, I'm asking the part of the, <clears throat> the cross section of one produced neutron, the other produced neutron, which one? Photon emitting side dominates or the former emitting side dominates? No, they're, they're independent. Yeah, yeah, but the, for the events you selected, um, which one have a larger? Because you're saying the formula have a larger virtuality and density for the. You know, but the, you know, the, the, the formula and the neutron emission that they are independent. Uh, yeah, but you have to excite the nucleus. So we. But you didn't excite the nucleus by exchanging the formula. Mm -hmm. Nucleus is not excited by the formula. Right. Or you excited by the. The photon exchange between the two nucleus, but that's independent from the okay. So excited. Oh, I see. So so those are <coughs> so, so go back. the neutron emissions from the photons. Yeah. yeah, that's why this dash line is here. Later. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. I need to move I see. Um, um, yeah. Quick question. Uh, M zero and X N, do you require that X N is on the Jeff side side or not not here? Not here. But you don't require we, we don't uh, with the coherent it doesn't matter. Actually for incoherent if we do see a correlation um, when you require this whether the neutron is in the same side as the jet side or opposite side of the jet side. Right? So that's a set set coherent coherent see any difference. We don't we don't see any difference. Yeah, that's the same. Uh, I wonder if you look at also production of photon of DVCS instead of JFSI. The photon, photon, oh, you mean the DVCS? Oh, yes. Uh, no, that we don't. Uh, that's very hard to do CMS. Yeah, okay. We are doing this in CMS experiments. So. Well, JFSI the, the formula, formula is uh, complicated. So. so, one reason to do JFSI the mass is uh, relatively heavy and that can provide us a hard scale for the perturbative brain pool. So I can go through the results, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be quick. So we, we reselect the neutron and we the, we measure Jeff side. Uh, that's very easy to measure with uh, peak. And from the PD distribution, we can separate the coherent and incoherent. Uh, if you have a question on detail, we'll talk later. And then here I want to show you this is the cross section of course is repeated from Alice and Alice CB. And there is some tension between these experiments in the, this region. 
where you can see that this the leading trace theory they can actually connect the alleys mid repeated and LHTP high repeated. So now here is CMS data. So we are uh, we follow the alleys trend uh, better. Um, and again, the, there is no theory that seems to de describe simultaneously the mid repeated and the high repeated. Um, and the next we measure the cross section in different centrality, zero and zero and zero and epsilon, epsilon and epsilon. Here we compare this. Here we compare the leading trace approximation theory, and I'm running out of time. But, um, so then, then the finally the goal is to, from here we disentangle the two way ambiguity. We finally measure the cross section as a function of the w w. Um, so this curve is the impulse approximation. Um, these points, they are from the previous uh, order that at least mid rapidity, there's no ambiguity, so you can put it here. And the forward rapidity, you can um, assume, so here assume this dominated by the low W. Uh, you can see these are the theory models and you can maybe think that maybe some model actually capture this data, these ones, um, but so this is the same, what CMS is there. So these three points here, these three points here. So what's really surprising that we see that uh, we see a trend that the cross section quickly rise first up to around 50 GeV, 10 to the minus three, and then it just almost stays flat all the way to 400 GeV, uh, 10 to the minus five and a half, almost 10 to the minus five. And a half. So oh, there's no model that can uh, describe that trend. Um, I'll keep this and so, so wait, wait, I'm gonna be confused in the, in the previous slide. Can we pull on until the because we're already past this time and then afterwards I was watching. Yeah, right. so I just want to uh yeah, I should uh say that the, the way you can interpret it is the one way is that maybe the gluon density is really saturated at high energy. The other possibility is that the gluon density is that uh is not saturated, but the cross section itself is hidden in entirety. That can also happen. That's Will be a deep black disk limit. Um, I have some discussion about black disk limit, but I'll skip that. And I want to say that um, one way, what we can do in the future, for example, if this comes from the black disk limit, then the, the lighter ion will be useful because we expect the cross section will scale with A to the two thirds. So in that sense, I certainly support to running lighter ions. And also, the incoherent cross section should be strongly suppressed as you go to small X because the system become smooth. Uh, uh, so this tail we have not uh, measured yet. Um, I, I will stop here. Uh, All right, let's we'll take uh, Dave. So I'm assuming Angie has a question. Yeah, I'm just curious. So the, in your previous slide, you showed the compilation of the LGCP, CMS, and IDP. You seem to see an abnormal behavior in the rapidity dependence, but here you see it rather smooth, uh, you know, you know, connecting all those uh, points uh, with uh, some arrows. But I just wonder what is going on there. So here, if we go back to the previous uh, one, this one, yes, here, right? So you can see that the, the three points, the CNS points actually above the mean rapidity level. So, it's all, so, so the, basically, the trend will be here and then it will come down. So it's not going up. The reason, the reason the theory over the data is because they didn't get the W dependent correct. The theory predicted uh, the function of W is still rising, whereas in the data we see it's saturated. Therefore, uh, this this will come down. I, I want to mention that in the near future we will be able to measure the full rapidity coverage. So we will see it continuously all the way to middle of the program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you will be able to fill in right. the gap. We will be able to fill in that, yeah. Another yes. question. <coughs> what will be your expectation from the EIC? Yeah, the, the EIC, the problem, the EIC cannot probe 10 to the minus five. Yes. The energy will come probably 10 to the minus. <coughs> so where will be the limit of EIC? So the, the limit, the EIC um, is gonna be, we probably will not reach the plateau. The EIC will not be able to approach the plateau, unfortunately. 
Yes. Okay. And uh, these three dot, three point on the left and three point on the right, you need to do this deconvolution, right? So, so separate them. So, so I get a systematic, so are they anti correlated or correlated? The, the, some some yeah. uncertainties. Uh, and if, if you go back to your formula where you do the decomposition, I want also the model dependence. Yes. Uh, what did, yeah, what it goes here like that could actually, uh, you know, like, it, yeah, I mean, control your systematic. What, what is the? So there's all the experimental uncertainties on the measurement. And, and, you know, I'll not go to the studies, but you can imagine all the experiments. Yeah. And then, yeah, the, the photon flux, the photon flux um, will also have uncertainty. And so now we want to evaluate it in group, for example, it depends on the nuclear uh, shape form factor, uh, yeah. nuclear yeah. nuclear per se. In starlight, we vary a number of parameters. We, we will see uh, how that varies. The, the, the output so that's part of the uh, right here. I think follow up on this question. The other assumption is the photon flux and the cross section in degradation are completely factorized, can be completely independent. But you know, in, even in the photon photon cross section, it, this kind of assumption is an identical way. The impact parameter from zero to infinity to get a photon flux, and then I put back assume there is a big dependence on the photon flux. So at least I feel internally it's not con consistent yeah, so, so because of, we are factorizing these factors, say photon flux and the cross section they are completely independent. Yeah, yeah so you're right. There, there, there is a lot of something here. Uh, that, that is right. Well, one thing I do want to point out that now if you believe uh, so if the, this data is correct right and, and middle is uh, turned down uh you, you do need a you do need a double dependence that will that need to uh stop growing so that, that's the reason this theory fails so from from here this is without any neutral selection which is inclusive if this is the rigidity uh, dependence we measure if this is correct it's already indirectly indicate that the double dependence needs to Stop growing at some point, which is consistent with what we extracted. So therefore, I think that a uh, uh, assumption is a problem. It could be problem. Well, that's not just quantitative. It's not quantitative, correct? So we need to, you know, actually do the calculation to quantify. Um, so I'm pretty confident. It looks like we've gotten into so uh, what about if we play with the beam energy? I mean, I know that the upgrades are going to be really at, like high growth CCD, but if you revisit the 2.76 data, would you expect anything different here than from the plot? The 2.76 uh, data, but if once we decompose it, we can just plot it as a function of the photon uh, nucleus uh, uh, energy. I don't, I will expect it fall on the same trend. Yeah. Yeah. It will be in close in energy. So. Or well, even different energy, mm -hmm. as long as you decompose it into the photon uh, nucleus central mass energy, that it should all form the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's independent of the, the central mass energy of the uh, two axes. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, Jen, asymmetric symmetric system help with this uh, problem? Uh, asymmetric? Yeah, because uh, you can you, you can know the photon flux directly. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, um, so take the ex extreme example of PLAT, right? Yeah. You, you can look for the, the photon from the proton in front with the light. But unfortunately, the smaller guy, they have the photon flux is, is not yes, smaller. Yeah. But uh, you have uh, AA prime, right? So, so you are probably a slightly smaller A. Um, smaller A? Yeah. Uh, I saw as if, if it's A. But at the moment you increase the size of the other one, then the mixture will start to happen. Yes, it will happen, but uh, we can control the mixture. Well, you can, in principle, we also come. Yeah, but, okay. yeah, but, but not, you know, not those kinds of things. All right, so I think we have one last question. Can yeah, can you go back to the, the giant apple resonance that plot where you are? Uh, the no, no, the, the, yeah, this plot. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 from left to the right. Uh, I mean, so so these two processes are, are assumed they are independent. So, 
So, so how do you calculate the joint apple resonance, the, the, the impact on their dependence? I mean, how, how well the move is uh, the, the, to, the, to determine the impact parameter, the correlation between number of neutrons you emitted and the, <coughs> and the impact parameter, how, how, how well you know this? It's based, it's based on the, the cross-section you measure uh, the, the, the probability you see a neutron. So, and from joint apple resonance, for example, and, and, and then from there, there's a connection to impact parameter to here proportional to one over t square. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, um, this is the this is a model or the model is this is a level of um, understanding of joint theory. So all right, I can do all the time, but maybe we can return afterwards. All right, let's say hey one more time. And next up, we'll go down.